Hi again, Mark here from TalkingBass.net. This week, I'm going to be introducing you to the basics of reading sheet music and sight reading on the bass. Now, this is a big, big topic and obviously way too much to cover in one short YouTube video. And I've got a huge sight reading uh, course uh, coming up at TalkingBass.net very soon. In fact, if you're watching this video a few months from now, August 2015, then it's probably over there right now. But uh, to just whet your appetite and give you an example of how easy sight reading can be if you approach it in the correct way, I'm presenting you with uh, this lesson from the Basic Fundamentals course. Now, the Basic Fundamentals course is 48 lessons dealing with the essential elements of bass playing in order to provide you with a solid core foundation of skills. This includes everything from technique, to scales and arpeggios, to bass setup, to tone, to learning songs and sight reading. And it's a huge course split into, uh, into four modules and should give you enough material to keep you practicing for quite a while. Now, this lesson is from the fourth module and introduces you to the basics of reading. So if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to follow the link to Talking Bass and download the lesson material so you can follow along. Okay, enjoy. Over the next three lessons, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to the basics of reading music. Now, the next course I'll be releasing is the sight reading course, and that's a 12-level method for uh, taking you from the very basics, like this, through to advanced sight reading. So, in this course, I'll be keeping it pretty simple, but the main aim here is to show you how, you, how reading music can be a lot easier than you think, and uh, to kind of whet your appetite, because when non-reading players suddenly realise how simple it can be and understand that simple process that's involved, it can be, you know, quite a liberating experience. When I first tried learning to read music, I'd already been playing for a few years and I could already play pretty well. Uh, my technique was okay and I could, you know, play most songs and pieces that I was asked to play and everything was going well. It was only when I started music college that I was forced into reading music in, uh, you know, in the various bands and orchestras and I suddenly felt like a complete beginner. Now this can be uh, really tough for a lot of players because it's really frustrating to have to you know, stop playing all the cool stuff that you love at a much higher level and uh, just you know, sit working through simple bass lines and melodies at you know, a really basic beginner level. It's demoralising and it's boring and a lot of players just don't want to bother with it. Another problem is knowing what to practice. There aren't really any de uh, dedicated sight reading methods for bass guitar and bass teachers will often just experiment with random easy written bass lines and then the student you know, has to work through slowly figuring out each note as they go uh, pretty much in the hope that eventually you know, that speed of transferal is going to increase. Uh, now this would be fine if it had some immediate benefits, but it never does. It's, you know, it's a really long process that a lot of players tire of and uh, they just go back to playing that same old stuff. I used to ask other good readers how I should go about getting my reading up to scratch and the response was always the same. You just need to read. They tell me you just need to get in as many reading bands as possible. Now, this would be fine if I had some basic reading ability to start with, but I was terrible, you know, really terrible. No band would ever dream of giving me a reading gig or even letting me rehearse with them. It would be a complete catastrophe. And I think this gets to the heart of the problem. The people that I asked were, you know, or pianists or sax players or trumpet players, people that had been taught to read from the very first lesson. They wouldn't even be able to comprehend what it would be like to play without knowing the notes that they're playing. They just thought I was asking about how to improve my sight reading. What I was actually asking was, how do I start with learning to read music? You know, the absolute basics. You can't just practice reading if you can't read. You can't tell a child to practice reading books before they know how to read the individual words. And it's, you know, this is the problem facing many bass players. Teachers end up assuming a basic knowledge of notes and rhythms and other symbols, and they just skip that part. So I figured out my own way of learning to read, you know, just by myself. In the summer break, I decided I was going to sort out my reading because the following year was going to be pretty tough. So I set myself some exercises that I'm going to show you and uh, just put in a little time, doing a little bit each day. And by the end of the six weeks in that break, I'd gone from a non-reader to someone that could 
you know, pretty much sight read through an average uh, baseline, you know, not too difficult, but, you know, I could get through. And from that point on, it was just a case of practicing the same kind of stuff that I developed for myself previously, but at a higher level, you know, and, you know, general experience of reading in bands. So I got myself past that initial embarrassing non-reader stage. So I'll give you an introduction to the exercises that I used during that period. Uh, to begin with, the main approach involves dividing music into separate pitch and rhythm. So we can work on each separately and then once we've practiced them for a while in isolation, we can put them together and hey presto, it should be a lot easier. So we'll start with pitch in this lesson, but to uh, begin with, let's have a look at some of the absolute basics of written music so, we, uh, so that we know what we're looking at. So to begin with, here we have a stave. Now, a stave is the uh, five horizontal lines that you'll recognize from any written music that you've seen. And each space and line on the stave corresponds to a specific note. And those notes are determined by the clef. So here we have a clef. So this is the bass clef. Now, there are loads of different clefs, treble clefs, alto clefs, all kinds of clefs. But uh, this is a bass clef, and this is the one that we use with bass guitar. Now, when you use a bass clef, the lines and spaces are as follows. We have a G at the bottom line, then the notes ascend in order. So the space above that is an A, then we have a B on the next line, then C, D, etc. The bass clef is often called the F clef, because where the clef curls around and finishes, that's an F. So with a stave and a bass clef, if we see a note of any kind on any particular line or space, we can work out what it is. So this is a G, this is a C, this is an E, and over time you'll learn what all those are and you'll automatically be able to read them just like reading words on a page. Another important symbol to be aware of is the time signature. Now here we see a time signature of 4-4. Four, four. So you see it as 4 over 4. So that tells us that we have 4 beats for every bar. Now don't worry about the lower number for now, just look at the top number. So if we had 3-4, that would be 3 beats in a bar, 5-4, five, 5 beats in a bar. And the bars of 4-4 four, four are split up by bar lines, which are these vertical lines that we can see here. And that's pretty much all we need to get started. Now, I won't bore you with any more symbols for now. We'll just introduce a few more as we go. So uh, let's just try getting straight into some playing. So to begin with, we're just going to stick to two notes. The open E string and the F at the first fret of the E string, which uh, we're going to play with the first finger. So we're just going to use those two notes. The open E string is down here below the stave on what we call a ledger line. Now, if we only had the notes on the stave to play with, we wouldn't be able to cover that much range, you know. So we put these little temporary ledger lines in there to show notes above and below the stave. So, you know, it's better than having a stave with 20 lines on it. So if we put a note down here on that first ledger line, we have the open E string. And then if we look at the space above it, above that ledger line, so this is the space below the stave, we have that F there. So open E string, that ledger line below the stave, F, the space, below the stave. So now let's practice those notes. Now it might seem a bit too simple to just have a choice of two notes, you know, with, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it right anyway. But the point here is to start from absolute basics that seem too easy. And as you build up, you want to retain that feeling of it being too easy. So, you know, before you know it, you're going to be playing all over the place and it'll still feel too easy. So uh, we're going to start with just a random sequence of those notes, okay? Uh, so just going between the E and the F. And this is all on the PDF in the uh, lesson material, or the course workbook. And um, so I would certainly recommend printing it out because you don't want to be, you know, running down through, the, uh, down through the PDF on the screen while you're, you know, trying to play there. So uh, print them out if you can and then put them on a music stand or put them on a table or whatever and then just work through them. I've included the... Um, also the practice track there, so this is like the notes on the fretboard lesson earlier. So there's a, a, a metronome there with me playing the notes. So you get to, uh, so that you'll know when you've played them wrong. So like I say, download the PDF, print it out, and then you can work along with me just on these first two notes. So if you have the music there in front of you, uh, we can work through these. 
And uh, you'll notice there that we have some rhythms uh, attached to each of these notes. So you can see that it's that circle, that hollow circle. Now that circle is called a whole note. We'll be getting more into these in the rhythm lesson, but uh, a whole note lasts for four beats. So if I was to uh, play an open E string for the duration of a whole note, it would sound like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I'm holding that note for a count of four, okay? It just so happens in uh, the uh, time signature of four, four, that's a whole bar, okay? So you can see that for each of these notes, we've just got a bar, okay? So that's what we're gonna be doing, just working through those. So now I'll just play through those first two lines with the metronome set at 70 beats per minute, okay? So we're going slow with this. And, uh, and you know, count along with, you know, play along with me, Tap the foot on each beat, look ahead as you're playing through, so play the note, look at the next one and see where you're going to be. Like I said, we've got nothing much to, uh, to worry about, you know, we've just got the open E or the first finger there on the F, so, you know, 50-50 chance anyway. So, here we are with the metronome. Okay, so I'll give you a bar in. Oh, one, two, three, four. E, two, three, four. F, two, three, four. E, two, three, four. E, two, three, four. F, two, three, four. E, two, three, four. F, two, three, four. F, two, three, four. F, two, three, four. E, two, three. Four. E, two, three, four. F, two, three, four. E, two, three, four. F, two, three, four. E, two, three, four. F, two, three, four. Okay? So, as you were working through that, like I said, always look ahead, play the note, and immediately look at the next bar and prepare. Wait through the bar and then play. Look ahead, etc. And as you're working through that, keep count, tap the foot, okay? Now let's add another two notes. So we're going to add the G, third fret of the E string, A, fifth fret of the E string. And I'm not going to be using the open A because with this we only want to be uh, looking at one possibility of any one note, okay? So instead of having to make decisions as to, oh, shall I go for the open A or go for the fifth fret of the uh, E string, we're going to stick with fretted notes. Keeps a uh, consistency of tone and we don't have to make any of those decisions. So on the E string we have E, F, G and A. Now on the stave, uh, you'll see that we have open E string is the ledger line below and you know F is the uh, space below the stave just as we've just been working through. Then we have G is the bottom line of the stave and then A is the bottom space on the stave. Okay, so looking through those, E, F, G and A. Ledger line below, space, bottom line and then bottom space. So, that's the notes on the E string. Now, we're gonna use a specific fingering for those notes. We're gonna have, obviously, open E, we don't have any fingering for that at all, but then first finger for the F, second finger for the G, and then fourth finger for the A. Now, that might seem a bit of a stretch, and we've gotta do a bit of shifting around there, uh, but I want you to stick with that fingering throughout these, um, because it's gonna it's, it's make more sense as we move along the strings. So, um, you'll need to get a bit used to the jumps between them. The, the biggest problem that you'll have with reading this music is looking at the page and not looking at the bass uh, because you can't really afford to be looking backwards and forwards like that all the time because you'll, you'll, you know, you'll lose your place in one way, the, uh, one way or the other. So you need to make it so that you can read while keeping the hands in position. So I'll just let you in on something that I'm going to go through more in obviously the full sight reading course, but we'll, we'll have a look at it here. The main position that we're going to have the hands in is the first finger above the second fret. And this is going to be right across the strings, okay? So we're going to have one finger per fret. So we've got first finger takes the second uh, fret, second finger takes the third fret, third finger takes the fourth fret, and the fourth finger takes the fifth fret. So that's the position that we're in. Now the F 
is outside of that position. So we have to jump down for the F, but then we come back. So the standard hand position is going to be there, you know, with the first finger above the second fret. When we need to move down or up above or below either of this, we just jump down with the first finger or, you know, if we have to go above it to the fret above, we'll just move up with the fourth finger. But for most things, keep it in that area. You can always jump down for the F and then come back, okay? So to give you an idea of why we do this, I'm just gonna work up through the natural notes in that position, okay? So we start with the open E, then we have F, G, and A, now we're in position. So if we move across onto the A string, we have B, C, and D. So this is all the natural notes, so no sharps or flats, okay? So second fret, third fret, fifth fret on the A string. B, C, D. Then we move on to the D string, and we have E, F, G. So again, it's second fret, third fret, fifth fret. Then we move on to the G string, A, B, C. So that's second fret, fourth fret, fifth fret. So it's a C major scale as we work across. This is all the notes of C, uh, but we're obviously below there. So if we go through all those natural notes again, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And if you've used the correct fingering for those, you know, with the first finger above the, on the second fret, uh, second finger on the third fret, etc., you'll notice that we just stay in position all the way across. The only time that we go out of that position is with the F at the beginning, okay? So once we're past the F and we're on the second finger for the G, it's the same position all the way and then we have to jump down for the F and then back in, okay? So this is why I pointed that out on the E string. So just run through those natural notes and get used to that pattern, okay? Because it'll get you, I mean, it's very good for fretboard familiarity as well because you get, I mean, this is what we're gonna be using as we work through the sight reading. So now just before we run through this next note reading exercise, have a look at how we will be moving without looking at the bass. We want to be moving from the F to the G or the F to the A, okay? It's always easy to move back down to the F usually because we just jump back down to that same place, down to the first fret. But without looking at the bass, you know, looking away, you've got to get used to moving to the G with the second finger or from the F to the A with the fourth finger, okay? So you have to get used to that distance. And this takes a little bit of getting used to, and people always have problems with this when they first start out, because they'll go for the, you know, they're on the F, they go for the A, and they undershoot and hit the A flat, or overcompensate and go up here to the, you know, the A sharp up there, B flat. So you have to get used to that amount of distance. So um, it helps sometimes to you know hit the F there with the first finger and then just stretch the hand out a bit. If you stretch the hand out as much as it'll go, you might not make the A, but then it's just a little pivot of the thumb to get you to the A. And over time, you'll get used to how much that, uh, that distance is. And this is very similar to when you've got people like uh, Ray Charles or Stevie Wonder that are blind, you know, pianists or Glenn Gould, they, they play and you know, you think to yourself, ah, how, think, how can they do all this playing around? You know, they're blind, you know, but it's just that they get so good with the muscle memory and the distancing, you know, that they, it doesn't matter about, um, you know, about, you know, being able to see the notes. And if you think about it, if you're playing normally, if, you, if you're playing something that you know really well, you probably don't need to look at the neck. You know, when you're on stage, you know, you're looking at other things, looking at the audience, whatever. Um, you're not looking at your hands. Um, it's just that when you're sight reading, you start to get paranoid about it. You know, you're thinking, oh, got to make this jump. And because we're in this lower position, you know, it's a little bit of a big stretch. So just get used to jumping, you know, without the music there, just F to G and back, F to A and back. Just get used to that, okay? So now let's try through this next note reading exercise. So we've got E string first position, E, F, G, and A, okay? So open E there, ledger line below, F, space below, G, bottom line, A, that's the uh, bottom space, okay? So with the uh, metronome at, uh, this time we'll go for 80 beats per minute, okay? So we'll go through and I'll give you a bar in and I'm just gonna go through the first two lines, okay, to save time rather than going through the whole page. But like I say, you can just go through with the backing track or a metronome 
do the whole page, okay? So, so one, two, three, four. G, E, G, F, A, G, F, E, A, E, G, A, E, A, F, A. Okay? So if you have any problems with that at any point as you're working through and you get paranoid about which note you're on, you know, because you've got four notes to play with there, you've got a fair bit of distance between each uh, pluck. Um, if, you, if you get a bit worried about where you are on the neck, have a look and then look back. But always have a look at your surroundings on the page. I mentioned this in the notes of the fingerboard lesson earlier on, and it's the same principle here. Look at the notes that you're going to be playing after. Try to look at three bars at a time uh, and then just think, right, okay, when you look back, instead of just seeing a G, let's say, and then you just look for a G and think, oh no, I've got the wrong G, look at the notes that are around it and then it's the familiar territory when you look back and you think, oh, okay, that matches, okay? Now let's look at the A string. So we have the notes B, C and D just like I showed you as we went through all the natural notes in that position. So we have B, second fret of the A string, C, third fret of the A string, and D, fifth fret of the A string. And the notes B, that's the, uh, the second line from the bottom on the bass clef, C is the second space from the bottom, and then D is the middle line. Okay, so you'll get used to these as we work through them. So again, B, C, D. So if you have a look at the A string uh, reading uh, sheet there, like I say, print it out and uh, put it on a table, music stand, whatever. We'll work through there. So again, at 80 beats per minute, let's try just going through those three notes. Oh, one, two, three, four. B, C, B, D, C, D, C, B, C, D, B, C, B, D, B, C. Okay, so like I said, you can just work through that whole sheet. Now, one thing I would say is don't um, don't just think to yourself, ah, oh, uh, that's easy, I can do that, and then just move on to the next page. Spend some time going over and over the, that one sheet, okay, the whole page. Because this isn't just about thinking, oh, I can do that. This is about creating little neural pathways in your brain. You want to create the association with those notes and the, the neck. Uh, and this brings me to an important point because with sight reading, it's, it, it becomes less of a, uh, of a look at the note, you know, play, find the note, play the note. That's too many, um, that's too many things to think about too many processes. Uh, we want to cut it down to one single process or two processes. We want to see the note, see that little picture, you know, that, little, that line or that space, that little picture and think that is that fret. We don't want to even be thinking that's a D, okay, you know, so you see the symbol, it's a D and then think, okay, a D on the neck, there's a D. Too many processes. That little picture equals that fret. Okay, that's what it needs to be uh, taken down to because when you start playing music properly and you're reading through all these things, you do not have time to sit there thinking about what each note is or where it is on the neck. It's got to be automatic because the thing that we end up reading is rhythms. 
you won't be reading notes eventually. It's that's that becomes such a small part of this because there's only so many notes on the neck. There's only so many notes on the stave. There's only so many notes that you're ever going to read. That becomes automatic. It's the rhythms that you'll be reading, and even that should become automatic to some extent. But because you are going to be looking at rhythms so much, um, you've got to have these notes, these pictures automated. So, like I say, you don't want to be thinking D. Where's a D? There's a D. Play the D. None of that. That. That you can't be doing that. You can't afford for that. So we've got to build up these neural pathways. We've got to make it so that that equals that. And so, I mean, with this exercise in particular, we're turning it into that line, the D in the, mid, the middle line, equals the fourth finger on that fret. You know, that's what it becomes. It becomes muscle memory. Now, important tip. If you keep playing through those sheets and you know it's a long process and you know you, you need to keep going over them because you just don't feel like you're getting it, and you start to memorize the notes, you know, without wanting to, you know, you've just seen them so many times that you just know what's coming up. Write some of your own out, just random notes. Okay, this is how I did it. I just wrote random notes. I had some manuscript paper, empty manuscript paper. I took those uh, four notes there, E, F, G, and A, and I just wrote them out randomly. You know, I tried to mix them up as much as I could, and then I just practiced them myself. Same with the A string, B, C, and D. Just, you know, just get some manuscript paper or print some out, and then just, you know, write those notes out. Make your own charts. Um, if you don't start memorizing it, I mean, I've put quite a few notes on there, so the chances are you won't start memorizing it because it has no melody to it in particular. Um, but if you do, start to write them out. Another way you could do this is just by starting on a different line. Uh, that might be enough to make you, th you know, to shake that memorization kind of thing. But uh, like I say, if you do start to memorize it and you're thinking, oh God, I can't really do anything about this, write your own out. So now finally, let's combine the E and the A string. So this is the E and A string combined sheet. So all together we have E, F, G, A, B, C, D. Okay, so we're going almost a full octave there. We've got the E all the way up to the D. So again, E, F, G, A, B, C, D. From the ledger line at the bottom through to the D, the middle line, okay? So this is quite a few notes, considering that we only started with E and F, you know, the first two notes. This is quite a few notes there and quite a lot of the notes that you'll encounter in bass lines. So, Let's try going through that uh, through that sheet. Uh, so again, with the metronome at 80 beats per minute. Two, three, four. G, two, three, four. A, two, three, four. F, E, B, C, A, C, D, E, G, A, B, C, F, D, like I said, I'm only going through the first two lines. You can just continue down. So this is the basic method that we can use for developing our pitch recognition. Now in the sight reading course, I'll be expanding on this a lot, you know, through all the different levels as we move on to the D and the G strings, all the different positions up and down the neck, then with the accidentals, sharps and flats, and all the different keys. But this is just to get you started. Now, as you can imagine, when you work and you're reading in this way, your fretboard familiarity of all the notes becomes much, much better. Once you've been sight reading in the different positions on the bass, you'll know every single note on the neck without even thinking about it. So it's more than just working on your sight reading. It helps with every part of your playing. And when you perform the same kind of isolation exercises with rhythm, then that side of your playing is going to improve too. And that's what we'll be looking at in the next lesson.